It was just before 7.30 p.m. on February 9th, 2004, when Maura Murray was last seen. Her car was found damaged, locked, and abandoned on Route 112 just outside of the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Her disappearance has haunted and frustrated family, friends, and a community of people searching for the truth. Since that night, there has never been a credible sighting. You're listening to the Missing Maura Murray podcast. Welcome back to the Missing Maura Murray podcast. It's been a couple weeks since our last show. Lance, how's it going and how have these two weeks treated you? These two weeks have been pretty interesting. Um, it's going well. It's going well. Um, it, it's good to be back. Uh, I know that there's been a, a bit of a delay here, but um, it's all, all for good cause. We have a lot of information that we're trying to get through, and we have a lot of stuff that um, we're trying to figure out what we can put out there and what uh, can't be put out there right now. There is a lot going on behind the scenes. Yeah, the the podcast really... Um, the, the first maybe 10 to 12 weeks, uh, it was, you know, kind of going over the material that was already out there. But I think um, as the podcast gained some traction and some legs, I think, you know, well, obviously certain people came aboard that helped us get some very important information. So we've gone from going out there with uh, the documents and statements that have been in circulation for a while to actually uncovering things on our own and with other people, with the help of other people. So, um, yeah, I don't know if I was ready for that. Uh, but you know, you just kind of deal with it and, and, um, it happens so fast that you just kind of don't know whether or not you should say yes or no to it. So, um, you know, ultimately we said, yes, we have a responsibility to this podcast and to the listeners and, uh, the, uh, the post-production, as we gathered the information was uh has been and still is very extensive and obviously it was a a weird two weeks in that our last episode you know we had a threat uh or what we took as a threat um from an anonymous person online yeah i mean we can say it was a veiled threat it was enough where certain elements of one particular theory which i don't want to say was our theory came together with things that might have been a coincidence, but hey, it all came together in one circumstance and it was just a little bit overwhelming. And it all has to do with the things that, that are going on behind the scenes. Yeah. And the timing of the uh, the threatening email was really what kind of freaked us out in that hotel room in the first place. And that probably was a coincidence. Um, and, and I hope it was. I hope it was a coincidence too. Uh, and actually, I didn't think about it until right now. Nothing like that has happened since the day before we went to New Hampshire and the day we were in New Hampshire and a bit the day after. I mean, if you're talking about like technically into the early morning hours of Sunday, we haven't had anything like that. That And believe me, we're looking. We haven't had anything like that s- since. And we didn't have anything like that before. So the coincidence alone is pretty astounding if it was a coincidence that you know we plan this and a series of events happen. And the penny that we got tweeted from uh, from the Boneyard account, uh, a lot of people have, have tweeted us, or even I saw one comment on YouTube saying, well, you know, now that the penny has been uh, explained, um, you know, what do you guys think or, or whatever? And uh, I don't think the penny has been explained. I, I know that I wouldn't believe the person who sent the penny so I don't know. No. I don't know why uh, anyone else is. People will people will draw their own conclusions, and uh, I guess that's enough of an explanation for some people. But the account Boneyard, twenty fifteen, is a, is connected to a blog that deals with celebrity death pools, and to add on to the mystery of who this Boneyard twenty fifteen was and the tweeting of the penny. I went to the uh, the link to the blog to the death pool, and when you scroll down, there's uh, a, a spot for comments, and I believe there were only two comments there, and one of them was from a Julie Murray, and if anybody is uh, listening to this show and they know, Julie Murray is the name of Maura's sister, and the coincidence there was 
was, I mean, that is another astounding coincidence. And when you click on what she commented, it was simply, I think she was just asking if the uh, list was up to date. But in the in the midst of all of what was going on, as you're as I was looking into who Boneyard 2015 was, to see Julie Murray's name there as as a commenter could have been a completely different Julie Murray. It probably was, but or it could have been somebody who just made that name up to to freak us out. It's it's just uh, it again. It was too much of an astonishing coincidence. So no, that tweet of the penny has not been explained, and I think we're. I think if we just kind of dismiss it as like, oh, it's explained now, then we're missing something. We're not doing our jobs. Yeah, and uh, and the explanation from Twitter was that uh, someone named Mindy took credit for it, and uh, and said that that was her other account, and uh, so I started messaging Mindy and Boneyard private messaging, and she said that her uh, her direct messaging wasn't working. Uh, and then she just kept replying publicly that, oh, you know, it was just a joke. I was just listening to the show. Yeah, saw the year on the penny when I bought my coffee and thought of Mora. Uh, yeah, I, I do not trust this person or their Boneyard account, so I really uh, hope that other people wouldn't either. And uh, that brings me to another point is that I blocked her and the Boneyard account because I don't really want to see any of that anymore. And this goes against what Lance and I tried to do, what we started you know, doing and said we were going to do in the beginning of the show. We don't want to censor anybody. We don't want to remove comments or block somebody. Um, you know, we like to think we can deal with the criticism. It is loud lately. But if you're just writing us to troll us or to taunt us or to call us pussies for getting afraid of a penny, you're going to get blocked. And we're not going to think twice about it because we don't have time to think twice about it. And I know people out there are listening right now and they're thinking, oh, you don't have time to think twice about it, but you're doing a whole segment of your podcast about this. This is basically just to put it out there that we're going to take a little bit of time right now to let everybody know that this is not what we want to do. Anybody who does not have important, pertinent, or thoughtful theories will be blocked. We don't want to do that, but it's it's going to happen. We don't want this, we've said it before, we don't want this to turn into the cesspool that Reddit is or that Topics is, where it's just, it's just a back and forth disgusting mess. If you don't have information or if you don't have something to come to the table with in a thoughtful manner, then just move on to another Reddit page that you control. And we, we did get some emails from a few people on Twitter uh, saying that, oh, I, th- I think I've been blocked by, uh, by your Twitter account. You know, can you explain why or can you unblock me, please? And uh, we did speak to a few people and we confirmed the, their identity and we unblocked them. If you say something completely useless just to taunt us, I think that's pretty much where you're going to get blocked. And uh, I know Lance had an argument with someone on Twitter last weekend, and uh, he, you know, said how much you speculate, and then at the end just said, well, everyone knows she died in the woods anyway. Yeah, it wasn't so much the speculation. I, I honestly wouldn't have taken the bait if it was that. But the first word that that jumped out was the word nutcases. How are we associating ourselves with these nutcases? And I just needed to know what he meant by nutcases. And basically, he just didn't like John Smith. Okay, so you have no basis to call anybody a nutcase. And you said nutcases, and you're just referencing one person. So yeah, we went back and forth for a little bit. And it just came out in the end that he had his theory that she wandered into the woods and died. And it was... A simple case of well thanks for contributing and if you you know if you just wanted to give your theory you could have just given your theory you didn't have to go about this whole like roundabout way of insulting our professionalism saying that we ambushed tim westman i mean that guy came to us for the most part i mean we were right there we weren't on his property we were next to his property but he was outside we walked over and he and he agreed to talk to us there was nothing unprofessional about that yeah, I mean, I, I agree. He, he definitely could have went inside uh, if he if Tim wanted to, you know, he wasn't thrilled about us being there, but uh, he didn't he, he, he didn't stop talking. We had a, what, a like an eight minute conversation. Yeah. And to be honest, you can see everything at that corner. It oh, was yeah. Pretty, it was pretty obvious if he came out and he saw people doing what we were doing at that tree. He would know what we were. He's talked to John Smith before. If he 
maybe somewhere subconsciously he wanted to talk to us. Maybe he wanted to put it out there. He said that he listened to the podcast. And I mean, I'll be the first to apologize to Tim Westman if he's listening right now. If he feels that we ambushed him, we absolutely didn't expect that to happen, him to come out. But he starts mowing his lawn at a, in a time where it just didn't seem like anyone would just come out and mow their lawn. <laughs> um, I agree. It's just, you know, a- ambush is, is definitely not the right word to use. You know, it was a spontaneous interview is, is really pretty much the end of the explanation of what that was yeah yeah and i kind of want to say something about how this is this is going to be barring any extraordinary situation that happens with the trolls this will be the only time that we dedicate to this because we're not we're not bad guys we're not arrogant guys who think that we're doing something that is uh that's above everybody the reason why we're doing this is to include people and to get fresh eyes on this and Honestly, the, the, the fresh eyes that we've gotten on it have been by far in the majority. It's just the ones that start coming out, and we just, we've, we, we've started to see that this, you know, everything that you put out there in social media has the potential to be hijacked by these trolls. We've actually gotten some people to help us just on that end while we focus on the details of the case. I apologize for doing it. So if you feel like you've been wrongly blocked or censored, please email us you know, at missingmoramari at gmail.com and be, be polite about it. And, uh, and we'll confirm that your identity and we'll unblock you. And someone who didn't email us directly is Mindy and the Boneyard account. And I'm pretty sure we know why. To us, we think that that is the person who sent the threat. We think that's Miles Wainwright, and we believe we know who this person is. We believe we spoke with this person. We are currently accumulating evidence to win a case in a court of law against this person. We're gathering information. If our theory proves to be correct, we can take that information and present it to the proper channels and have further action taken so this particular person does not obstruct any potential outcome that this case might have. And if you're curious, this Mindy person in the Boneyard account, they did not message us privately or email us uh, about getting unblocked or uh, explaining the miscommunication, as they sort of put it. And that's because we believe this person is Miles Wainwright and is the person who sent the threat. And we believe we know who this person is. We believe we spoke to this person. And we have been in contact with the cold case unit about this person. Yeah, exactly. We we sent an email to the cold case unit. They got back uh, pretty quickly, probably within two hours. So what we've decided to do was kind of put some people on it who we have on our end and we're putting together as much information as we can in the circumstance that we need to provide information to proper channels and if further action needs to be taken to prove that somebody is obstructing any sort of outcome in this case then we're prepared to do that and if this continues and we do provide this information to the proper channels and it proves who we think this person is, then we'll make sure that we are able to speak about this person on the podcast briefly. And after the proof is in our hands and we reveal who this person is, we're doing it in order to prevent other people from communicating with this person, which will be a giant waste of time. And an annoyance. So we basically just want this person to stop. Just stop doing it. And we won't have to go to these measures in order to get you out of the picture. And uh, moving on from that, in a way, I just want to, you know, there is a lot of general anger out there just uh, involving this case and surrounding this case. And it's all over the Internet. It's on Reddit, Twitter, YouTube, and it's everybody fighting with each other. We just want to ask you guys to chill out a little bit. You know, everyone here wants the same thing, I believe. Uh, and if you don't want want a, a resolution here, then yeah, really leave everybody alone. The anger in the community is, uh, it, it's palpable. And it's pretty much everywhere this case is talked about. And it's a little confusing to us and a little disheartening. And probably one of the reasons it took us two weeks to do another episode. I know my energy was a little bit drained from all this. 
So please, we want to ask you guys to chill out a little bit, but we also, above all, want to ask you to respect the Murray family. I know that some of you can message Helena and comment on the Facebook page, and we even saw a comment from her asking for people to be respectful, and we know that this podcast has brought a lot of new ears and eyes into this case, and so we want you to please be respectful with the Murray family, especially if you're contacting them directly. Please do not do so uh, with any kind of anger or sarcasm or anything slightly disrespectful. Yeah, absolutely. What's kind of ironic is that the documentary that we decided to make over two years ago wasn't about finding her. It was really, if you look at exactly what it says, it's about the obsession that people have with the case. And as we dug into it a little deeper, we realized that this can have a conclusion. It can have some sort of closure. And as as we keep like pushing forward, new things come up and you know, I've said it before, we take on a responsibility because we, we, we've started this. But that doesn't mean that people have to take their own theory and lash out at anyone who doesn't have the same opinion as them. You really have to think about the family and you have to think about the people who are close to the family. And it's just not fair for them to have to deal with that at the same time as, you know, over a decade later, looking for someone that they love. And the last thing I want to say about this uh, this last episode and, and everything that came with it is that uh, we do the person that we're speaking of, it is not Cold and Hullfield. Um, I know we mentioned him in our Lincoln, New Hampshire episode, but uh, we do not believe the person who sent the threat is Cold and Hullfield. Actually, we think he is a friend of ours. Well, we're positive. We're positive that he's not the, uh, the person in... It's not because he speaks well of us in his blogs. We've talked to this person, and he's got an intelligence that is a lot more acute than myself, and a lot more acute than, uh, I hope you don't mind me saying, you and I combined. Yes, and throw in the person who sent the threats, too. Yes, he is He is a lot more intelligent than the person who sent those emails and the uh, Twitter picture. Intelligence is a funny thing because you can be very, very smart at, at one thing. You can be a genius in one thing, and you can be a genius in putting codes in your email header. And you can be a genius in putting it through so many uh, filters that you can't figure out who sent it. But ultimately, the trail will lead back to you. Well, there are more avenues that were taken. That, that's the other thing. Uh, yeah. Things that we don't really want to talk about right now, but uh, ways that, that people can be found guilty in court of law, we are going through some of those steps. So before we get into the spine of this episode, which uh, we want to talk about the items that were found in Mora's car, um, I just want to talk about the people that we would love to have on this show. Definitely. This is a call out to these people. If you are in any way listening, please get in touch with us at missingmoramari at gmail.com. Chances are you have already heard from us or will hear from us in the future um, anyway, but please, uh, we would love to have you on. Somebody that I'd really like to talk to is John Scarinza. He is the state police lead on the case up until he retired. He's spoken to James Renner, uh, left him a couple of voicemails, and uh, he hasn't got back to us. If anybody knows him, let him know we're good guys. We just we really need to get a, a, the details out there. I think that's what we want to do by putting these names out there. These are the people that can give us actual tangible facts. Dick Guy? Dick Guy, he was a first responder. He was the man who showed up on the scene, and he said the entire accident right from the get-go looked a little strange. Mark Ruddick, he was a Hadley police officer, and he was the person who responded to the accident that Mora had with her dad's car. Right, and he was the one that's on James Renner's blog when James talked to him. He asked him a, a few questions, and after a series of questions— uh, he simply hung up on James. When asked 
why he didn't pursue it as uh, a drunk driving case. We would want to talk to this police officer because we would want to know, did you let her go because she actually wasn't drunk and it looked and it just very well could have been somebody who overcorrected or was too tired and simply hit the guardrail so you let her go um the fact that he according to renner hung up on him just makes it that much more suspicious alden howes olsen i would still absolutely love to speak with um and we, you know we've been told alden listens we know he's active on twitter but he will block you if you follow him um but but there has been some information that we heard that came from alden that uh, if true is really big information, or at least could be. So Alden, at least, you know, for that reason, please contact us. We would love to suss out this lead and really confirm it. Exactly. And when we say talk to you, we don't mean, you know, let's call you up, start recording, and you're on the podcast the next day. We'll talk to you. We'll talk to you. We'll figure out what's going on. If you don't want to be on the podcast, you don't have to be on the podcast. We'll figure out a way to talk about your information after if you don't want your voice heard this goes with anybody we just need that we just need that information if you don't want to actually have a formal interview no problem but if we get the information then we have information that people can listen to for the first time and know that it's a fact and yeah we speak to a lot of people off air you know in between episodes Uh, it would probably shock most of the audience to know how many people we speak to on a weekly basis you know, we do take our time to, to look through this information and try to try to figure out if it's if it's important or not. But at least they came forward with important um, what they thought was important and they did it in a respectful way and uh, allowed us to kind of go through all the proper um, methods to either credit it or discount it. I know I would like to speak with John Green who uh, was a member of uh, the Topics blog, and uh, he wrote for Renner's blog for a little while. Yeah, he took over on Renner's blog when Renner needed to take some time off. He also went up into the Woodsville area, um, and from all accounts, he he came out of that situation um, a changed person. So that is, I'm just saying that based on what I've read and what I've been told. I think what he's come up with might have been some pretty good information. And we would, you know, would love to talk to him about the information that he's gotten. And his experience investigating it. I would love to speak with Rick Forcier. Yeah, I think that might be a long shot because Rick has always been kind of known as a, uh, and this is by no means in a bad way. Um, you know, he's a he's an eccentric kind of guy. Uh, he's a musician. You can check out his music on, uh, on YouTube. Um, Honestly, seems like a cool guy, but there are so many conflicting reports with not only um, what he saw or said he saw, but um, his property, how it was searched by the police. Um, he moved away. There's a there's a lot of stuff that we could really um, we could really use some clarification on. We'd love to speak with Robinson Ordway, who saw the red truck, and because the red truck has been something that really uh was kind of in the background in you know over the past few years uh it it felt to me like it was something that was kind of there but it was kind of looked at but it wasn't looked at and then recently you know in the past year or so more eyes have been uh directed towards uh the the whole red truck and after talking to John Smith, I think I realized like this red truck might actually have a little bit more importance than 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 we think. And I'm not even saying that in a way where you know whoever's driving the red truck has anything to do with their disappearance. But that red truck, according to her report, was looking for somebody, and or waiting for something. And they were in the area at the time. And I would love to know if they what they saw. Maybe they saw another car. You know, I'm not I'm not trying to point out the driver of the red truck as somebody who had anything to do specifically with this is this disappearance. But, you know, maybe they saw something they were looking for something. Robinson Ordway said it in her statement that it you know, she it was obvious that once they saw her, they realized that this wasn't who they wanted to see. And they drove off and then she saw it at the store. So maybe they saw something and maybe they just haven't had the opportunity or the motivation to come forward with anything. Maybe they haven't really thought about it. Yeah. And maybe hearing something like this might draw their memory. 
I would love to talk to Todd Landry, and that's a name that I really haven't, um, I don't think we've spoken about very often here. Uh, Todd Landry is uh, one of the investigating troopers for the New Hampshire State Police, and he was the one who um, had the uh, possessed property report that was posted to the public, and it uh, it detailed out the items in Moore's car. Uh I would love to talk to him. I don't know what the legal parameters are to uh, to speak to somebody like this about an open case, but even if we hear back from him saying I can't talk about this, that would be that would be good. So speaking of the items found in Morris' car, we do have an entire list, a complete list except for possible items that were confiscated into evidence by the New Hampshire State Police. Right, and I'm going to preface this by saying what we have here is a breakdown of the items found in in Morris' car and these items were to my knowledge released to Kathleen Murray and then reseized by the New Hampshire State Police and the date on this property report this possessed property report is June 28th so that leads me to believe and correct me if I'm wrong that this means that this these items were possessed back to the New Hampshire State Police after they were given to Kathleen Murray. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. Yeah. Not exactly the log that they kept when they seized the car and the items originally after the accident. So the point is you're saying that Kathleen Murray or someone else could have added to this list? No, no, I'm not I'm not indicating at all anything like that. I'm just saying I don't want there to be any thought out there that this is a detailed report of items taken from her car directly after the accident when they received the car. Like when they when they got the car and they started logging the items that were in the car in the days after the disappearance, that this is what we're looking at. We're actually looking at something that was dated June 28th of 2004, which leads me to believe that after they seized the car and seized items, they released them to Kathleen Murray. And as we know, they went back to Kathleen Murray and said, we need those back. I think that's the list that we're looking at now. Okay, so there are or could be other items that the police had already entered into evidence that is not on this list. Of course. I think the big question is the uh, the alcohol that was in the car, and you know, there's no alcohol listed here. Yeah. Okay, so let's go over this list. First thing we have is a Tundra garment bag, green. We have an open Tic Tac container, an ESPN zone card, MCI prepaid phone cards, TTI National Inc. calling card, Samsung travel adapter, and some paperwork. Yeah, miscellaneous paperwork. A pair of Puma sweatpants, black and white, Express polo, uh, long sleeve, a sports bra, Old Navy V-neck sweater, you have an Abercrombie and Fitch pants, Old Navy sweatshirt, sneakers, pink sock with cow design on it. I gotta say, the first time I ever read this, like it kind of made me sad because this is it. It just struck me as somebody who is like packing and going somewhere, and not necessarily planning anything it almost made me feel guilty to read this yeah i agree it's almost it almost feels like an invasion of privacy it is it does very humanizes her in a way that hasn't really been to me yet yes absolutely paper mate pen perfect blend makeup pencil bra 75 cents in coins Big Y tokens and also a Big Y plastic shopping bag. That's a supermarket chain in the area. Yeah, in Western Massachusetts. Uh, we have an army track duffel bag, a health professional's drug guide, nurse, nursing student at, uh, at UMass. We have a, a notebook, a spiral notebook. We have UMass complete health history questionnaire. Um, all those things suggest to me that she took her schoolwork with her. That's something that that's very interesting, right? I mean, she. Some people have theorized that she was done with school. That she had, uh, you know, this was it. She had packed up. She's going away, and she's going to be done with school. One thing that I keep thinking is, if you're done with school, why are you taking the stuff? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also a pharmacology book. And then you get to Vermont Attractions Map. So there's a Vermont Attractions Map. Again, we're all, we're, we're just... We're just uh, reading these things off the list. It's not like we're trying to piece things together. This Vermont attractions map could have been in there for months and months Years. and months. Yeah, exactly. It's also a lot of things to do with uh, her car. A Luma seal. Yep. These are things that help, uh, you know, the fix a flat, the power steering fluid, carpet and stain remover. These are all, I mean, that's could be for the, uh, for the fabric of her car seats. Um, these are all things that, that you kind of, you know, I, I think anybody, if they have a car, you know, for a few years, car, you know, these are things that just kind of gather up in your car. You got a soft tire, especially in this area, you know, the, uh, once, once the, uh, once the winter comes around, once January, February come around, you have, you you're, you're, you do lose air in your tire and you know, you have, um, you have a slow leak or something, or it's just like the natural elements. You fill your tire, you, you put the, uh, a Luma seal, the fix a flat, those types of things. This is all things that you find in a used car, in a basic used car. Multicolored glove, black gloves, a uh, jar of baby kosher dill pickles opened, bottle of diet cherry coke opened, and a package of Twizzlers opened. And can I say, I just think that combination is kind of adorable. I was just like, that's honestly where I started feeling like really, you know, where it was all very human to me was, uh, you know, we, we heard that she likes to drink, uh, the, uh, diet cherry Coke through a Twizzler as a straw, which is, uh, and the, uh, the, the dill pickles, you know, so she's snacking on dill pickles and drinking the diet cherry Coke. And yeah, she, you know, probably, you know, they found the traces of wine in the cherry Coke, so she poured wine in her cherry Coke, you know? What college kid hasn't drank, uh, you know, or driven a car with an open container? I mean, I'm sure there are many, but, uh, you know, a, a lot of the kids I went to college with, not saying I did, but a lot of the people I went to college with uh, had definitely had experiences quite like that. Yeah. And right now my head isn't even at, you know, she's, you know, drinking and driving. It just seems like someone who needed to get some shit off of their mind. And they're going away. There's items in here that suggest that she didn't go into the woods. She wasn't going up there to commit suicide. She took her, she took her, her school, you know, textbooks with her. I mean, is that is that classic suicidal behavior? Eastern Massachusetts roadmap, light bulbs. Headlights. Yep. A uh, Sears plastic bag, a Starbit screwdriver. As we're looking at this, I'm just, I'm thinking about my old truck. And if they ever went through my truck when, uh, if I, you know, if I was in this situation and they went through my truck, you could probably, I mean, there's, there was so much random stuff in there just over the years. Of course, the Not Without Peril book, CD case with 34 CDs. CD holders, CD player, AC cell phone power adapters. Yeah, I just want to say about the CDs, doesn't that just kind of take you back in time? You know, when you had you have like that CD case that's uh it's like strapped onto the sun visor. I don't know if that's where it was, but or maybe it was one of those books with a zipper. Just like picturing her driving up there and you know, there's a portable uh, CD player with a CD inside and you know, you just like picture her listening to music and it just kind of like the, the thought about, and I'm not trying to push any theory here, but the thought about her going out there to kill herself or getting beat up and running away, it's just not in my head when I read this. And maybe it's a gut feeling, but it, that that's just not in my head. Speaking of the music, she also had a Led Zeppelin cassette tape and a U2 cassette tape, which even... Uh, dates those who remember um, cars with cassette inputs uh, even more. But she even has some good taste in music. Yeah, if you're into U2. I mean, it was a popular era for U2, but not necessarily the best era for U2. You know, it could have been that she bought the CD and listened to it a couple of times and was like, yeah, this sucks. Well, it was a cassette tape, so maybe it was the Joshua Tree. 
we got more car items here. We got a radiator funnel for radiator fluid. We have a, a Shaw's plastic bag, Shaw's the supermarket, which um, I guess might have raised a little bit of debate depending on where the Shaw's supermarkets are located. But again, if I were to look back at the, the car I had, um, you could probably find shopping bags in there from places that like Winn-Dixie or something. There was a cosmetic pouch with assorted makeup, uh, <laughs> VO5 hair dressing, aspirin, a toothbrush, birth control was in there with four pills missing. She's apparently still taking her birth control, right? Uh, either that or it's old and she had taken it before. Yeah, I mean, I know there was some searches related to pregnancy, so there was some speculation about maybe she was pregnant. Um, but based on this, it sounds like she was on birth control. She took it with her. Or it had been in her car. Bottle of got-to-be-good shampoo, bottle of bonbons, fingernail polish, packs of sleeping pills. And I hear you pause there because we're supposed to talk about the sleeping pills and we're supposed to say that she took a bunch of sleeping pills and wandered off into the woods, but we're not going to take the bait. No, we're not going to take the bait. I mean, you and and I'm not going to get into it too much, but sleeping pills are over the counter sleeping pills. Simply sleep sleeping pills is what it's called. That's pretty much like drinking uh, chamomile tea. Right. Or like taking melatonin. Yes. That might knock you out for a couple extra hours or something like that. Right. But that's certainly not what you would take to commit suicide. Bottle of skin quencher, some deodorant, some moisturizer, some proactive solution cleanser, Victoria's Secret body lotion, toothpaste. Cucumber melon fantasy body spray, razor. All of this right here is stuff that she went into her bathroom and just put in a bag. And then a lot of hair product, herbal essence shampoo, head and shoulders shampoo, um, Crest white strips, travel toothbrush. That's the second toothbrush that she had with her. It's like the fourth bottle of shampoo. And I know uh, that on James Renner's blog and some other places, the head and shoulders was, was debated. Uh, women don't use head and shoulders. We actually got a few emails that saying that... Uh, that, that people do use head and shoulders. Women do. And actually, uh, one of the, um, the the new people that we're working with, uh, who is a female, told us that she has used head and shoulders in the past. So uh, I don't think we can say that in, in, in a vacuum, that women do not use head and shoulder shampoo. I mean, we could say maybe there was somebody else in the car with her, and these items might have, you know, because when I saw multiple bottles of shampoo. So my first thought was that there was... You know, maybe there was somebody else in the car and it was this person's belongings, but look at everything else that was in the car. There's nothing to suggest anything else was somebody else's belongings. Skyvalleyforyou.com pen, which is, one, I, I would say, one of the more interesting items and that, that's something that's been followed up on. There's been uh, a little bit of research that has gone into why she would have that pen. Look into it, exhaust it, see what you can come up with, but... Again, look in your own car. You, you you probably have something that you grabbed from a restaurant that was, uh, you know, someplace that you've never heard of or will never go to. Makeup mirror, a single tampon, multi-purpose funnel, photograph of her half-brother, Curtis Murray, who uh, we, we spoke about on an episode with Clint Harding, uh, that that photo was a, a baseball photo of of Kurt Murray found in the Not Without Peril book. Kind of like a bookmark. USMA patch? That's the uh, United States Military Academy. Probably something that she um, got from West Point. Uh, fleet fast lane toll passes. That brings you back a little bit when Fleet Bank was used to be Bank Boston. and Before Bank of America took before, them both over, yeah. yeah. Flathead screwdriver? Uh, you already said the screwdrivers. I said one. These oh. are, this is two and three. A flathead screwdriver, red-handled Phillips screwdriver, so that's the third screwdriver that's been found in the car. Tire gauge, pretty common. Sure, it's stuff that you just kind of acquire with a used car. Pack of extra chewing gum, cigarette lighter, uh, auto automobile cigarette lighter, some pens, a pencil, 3 by 5 card with directions, which I'd love to know where the directions were to or from. Or... Perhaps it's directions on how to change a tire. 
I suppose we don't know if it's driving directions. Yeah, good point. Uh, I mean, they probably would have written instructions instead of directions. Yeah. Some more paperwork. UMass student telephone directory. And finally, an empty cellophane pouch. Yeah, and I know that we've had some people um, theorize that the cellophane pouch was uh, the, the, the like on a cigarette pack. Yeah, it sounds like it is. I, I don't know what else I would describe as an empty cellophane pouch. But also, most people who smoke cigarettes don't usually take that that uh, plastic off like the bottom of it. And you know what? You get that same cellophane from a pack of gum. Yeah, that is true, too. You know, there's, there's a lot of those things that you peel off the top and could have been something that a book was wrapped in. Could have been something that was in her car for years, left by a friend, you know, that, you know, or someone that she met once or, you know, as a part of a group of friends. It seems like a lot of this stuff that's been found in her car has been there for a long time and not necessarily used over and over or currently. So I, it's really hard to read too much into this. Yeah, it really is. And it's funny if, we're, you know, we're talking about the wrapping around a pack of cigarettes or the cellophane wrapping around a book, why that would be specifically listed and not just listed as uh, miscellaneous uh, trash. Would it have been taken as evidence if that's what it was? Exactly. Because of the, the Faith Westman's account of a man smoking a cigarette, which Could was be. one of the first things she said. And that's really the only reason this is an interesting item at all on this list. Yeah, because, I mean, they list out like uh, miscellaneous paperwork and they list out um, the card with directions. And they're, they're not specific on that. It's just they're very specific on other things. And then it's empty cellophane pouch. So, yeah, it stands out in its, uh, in its nondescriptness. After I read all of this, I'm reading through it page by page and, you know, flipping the pages over and, and it's, it's really, it's really depressing. It's really, well, and it's really sad because at the very end, after it says miscellaneous paperwork, it just says end. It's going through the, the list of things that she had in her car. Like you said, it really humanizes the whole thing. And as, as you're looking at it, you start picturing the drive and you start, you know, picturing her as a person with the, the Twizzlers and the Diet Coke and her using them as a straw and listening to Led Zeppelin and, you know, maybe going through her CDs. And that's what you're picturing as you're, as you're flipping through the pages of this possessed property report. And the very last thing on it says end with literally 50 X's. And it's just a clerical thing. You know, it's just, a, you know, at the end of it, it's just a default thing. It says end. It's just that's darkly appropriate. Just personally, I, I don't know if, if I want to even go into this, but, you know, as far as the Twizzlers and, and Cherry Coke and the pickles, I've done at times while I suppose trying to relax is, uh, is cracked a bottle of olives and, uh, and like Snickers and eating them at the same time. And I know that's disgusting. I don't know really what that is, like a comfort thing. It's, it's almost like a, like maybe slightly depressed behavior. I don't know. I also know people who they just love big flavors. I got two, two schools of thought on it. People who just love these flavors, you know, they love a combination of flavors that shouldn't go together. Um, and also, it's, uh, you know, a lot of people will theorize that, that these are things that, that pregnant people do, by no means suggesting that, that she's eating pickles because she's pregnant. I'm just saying this is something that can be put into the melting pot of, of theories. And then you can dismiss them. Someone can come forward and say, I knew Mora while she was going to school. Um, you know, I grew up with her, whatever. She loved pickles. You know, and we can just dismiss it. But, you know, that's a school of thought. So without speculating too much on this list, you know, I really don't know what else to say about it. I really wanted to talk about the list. I wanted to verbalize, say out loud the things that were in her car, because I feel like we have an obligation to to humanize it, like you said, with beyond anything else that we've discovered in this case and anything else that we've read I don't think I've I've had something in my hands and read that has done that for me. Seeing seeing this makes makes you know you you always have to remind yourself that this is a person. And seeing this list like you can see anybody can read this list and and they can find things in that 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 they 
have in their own car that they have in their bathroom that they use on a daily basis and then the little the the little idiosyncrasies that are in there like the twizzler used as a straw in the diet coke um and we can put it out there there's a lot of people out there that that think about her as you know she got drunk and she's drunk driving and she slams into the snowbank and into the tree but when you when you look at the list it's yeah you know maybe she poured the wine into the diet coke bottle but she's not this out of control she's a normal college kid she's a normal person it seems like good and bad and messy i mean most girls at that age you know are i <laughs> you know i think uh are kind of messy yeah and uh and i know i know some of the women in my life at that age this sounds very familiar yeah exactly you can look at it and you can say i know people like this or i'm like this or i have elements of this and it's really it's really amazing how far we've come and it really hasn't even been that long it's only been a couple of months but we called this person a scorpion elements of her behavior reminded me of a story about the nature of a scorpion. And then I read this list of items in her car, and it was the furthest thing from my mind when I read that list. This is a normal person. Do you feel bad about talking about her in that way before? No, because I didn't have any information before. I, I mean, I feel I feel like I was uh, not misguided, but I feel like I maybe misguided myself into a certain mindset based on what's out there and once you actually get your hands on something that's real and tangible and it changes your your view i mean i i feel bad that the thought was in my head and it was put out there but it wasn't intentional and i don't feel like i i feel like it's it's all it's all kind of for a purpose I feel like I needed to think of this whole thing as as uh, somebody with a dark side that had a plan before this came up. We set out to do this show in looking at all aspects, all avenues, all potential anything, all potential leads, clues. So, yeah, we, we had to take the thought that she was manipulating um, her life and this accident into trying to start a new life. Uh, that's just one of the angles that that is brought up and and is one of the theories out there. And so, in doing the show that we set out to do, we had to talk about it. Yeah, exactly. We didn't have to name the episode "The Scorpion," but at the time, we didn't have this information in our hands. So, yeah, I, I feel bad that those thoughts were even there. But that's that's the problem with this case is that that's what you have at the time. And the more you push into it and the more you start to dig, the more people come forward and we get this information. And yeah, you get a chance to say, you know, wow, this is, again, this is not somebody who, yeah, they might have had a dark side, but who doesn't? You know, and I'm not looking at it like that anymore. looking at this list as a whole what does it say to you does it say to you that she left the car in a hurry because i mean obviously all a lot of these items are things that you would take for an overnight or a few nights away or you know on any vacation really it seems to me that that she left the car abruptly right yeah it seems to me like she had you know let's say hypothetically a couple of bags packed and she grabbed what she could and she left and she had a couple of bags packed and these were the bags that had her bathroom stuff car items you know she's not going to dig through her car and find all the car items so it's it strikes me as a couple of bags were packed she unless she had uh you know she basically left with the clothes that were on her and anything she could carry Without getting into it too much and and putting the idea in somebody's head that that she jumped into a car that was following her in tandem or she uh, 
you know was yanked into was yanked into somebody's car or yeah exactly what was left in the car were items that have been in the car for i don't know months items that were packed and put in a bag and she took what she had on her she left with what she had on her yeah and maybe she did take a bag and you know we just don't know obviously right because it wasn't found but if she did take a bag, then the bag with the toothpaste and the toothbrushes and some of the undergarments, like that would have been the second bag that she would have thought to take. Right. I mean, what we have here is the uh, Tundra garment bag. We have the Army Track duffel bag. These were bags that were found in her car. These are bags that she could have had her, um, you know, the, uh, the long sleeve polo, the sweatpants. The bathroom items, these were all packed in, in these bags that were left in the car. You know what's missing is, is I know I said undergarments a, a minute ago, and I guess I meant bras because it doesn't have any underwear on this list, huh? Because that is probably one of the first things you'd, or socks, right? Those are probably, that's the first bag that you'd grab, I suppose, if you could only choose one and you pack three or four bags, right? If you had time to take a bag. If you had time to take a bag, that's right. The... If you were sitting there thinking, like, what's my what's the important bags? But I mean, I'm looking at these items in here. It couldn't have been more than. I mean, if we are now going into the realm of she's throwing a bag into a car to drive away. I, yeah, I'm not. I'm just saying that. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. If 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 a car is pulling up and and you're you've had this planned getaway, one, the car pulls up, or you meet the car somewhere. You throw more than one small backpack in that's why it's so confusing this is somebody who just like literally left their car if somebody had come up and was going to pick her up somebody would have seen that car stop and pick her up and she throws the bags in the car and they take off if she had packed these bags for a getaway somebody would have you know she's not gonna she obviously didn't grab these bags and start running with them because they've been you know they they were found in the car so she didn't grab these bags and start running and throw them in another car and then take off she literally, the fact is, is she, she literally left with what she could carry and what was on her body. Either that was a, a premeditated plan to throw people off later on. So people would look in the car and say, she had all of this stuff packed. And now we're back to the, you know, dark side of human behavior. Maybe she's trying to fool somebody. Maybe she's running away from somebody. I don't know. In that scenario. But she literally left with the items that were on her the items on her body and what she could carry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, possibly in a backpack or something smaller. Yeah. And I know we're going to get a lot of shit from people if we say something like, this is not what somebody who wants to kill themselves would would pack before they leave. It's hard to say anything definitively. I don't think somebody has in their bag packed tampons, birth control pills, things that suggest going beyond the next day interesting lists so uh if you have any ideas on it please tweet us um or email us uh, the twitter handle is at maura murray doc the email address is missing maura murray at gmail.com we're also on facebook at the disappearance of maura murray and we're on instagram as well the handle being missing maura murray have we uh have we Come to the end of, uh, of this episode, because I feel like we could really talk about this for, for a little bit longer, but our obligation to our listeners is that we've presented this information and, uh, and you know, let's figure it out. And uh, I don't want to go on too much longer with, uh, with us kind of drawing our own conclusions. And, uh, and we've got plenty more to talk about. We're uh, recording some more episodes uh, very soon got a good interview coming up and uh, we also want to talk about the phone records in one of our next episodes exactly so what we're going to be um the beginning of this show where we talked about the trolls that's uh unless something extraordinary happens that will be the last time that we address this we're going to deal with it internally coming up we're we've made a very uh, aggressive push to get people on the show to talk about things like the accident itself um and, uh, and everything surrounding the case without giving uh, too much of that away. Well, thank you very much for listening to this episode. We will be back with more very soon, we promise. And thank you for the, uh, for the patience 
in between episodes. I hope everybody understands uh, the reasoning behind it, and you can uh, you know you can contact us anytime with the email uh, address that that we've given out. Anyone who's uh, following us on Twitter, you can contact us that way as well. And uh, you know we're more than happy to talk about this and and vet all of the information. Yes, and if you think we've blocked you or censored you in any way. Um, wrongly, you know, please uh, email us. Open a dialogue with us. We're, we're actually pretty good guys. Missingmoromari at gmail.com is the place to directly message us. So thank you very much for listening to this episode, uh, everybody. And uh, tell your friends about the show. We uh, really want as many eyes and ears on this case as possible. So uh, to not let, um, you know, the memory of, uh, of this case just, well, you know, just become colder than it is. So uh, please help us out and spread the word. Thank you very much. Thank you.